it can be late. <laughs> Amen. Uh, Genesis 32. If you have your Bibles, Genesis 32. Amen. Just before I... Uh, Genesis chapter 32. I was dwelling on... Um, um, what to preach. No, I actually wasn't ready to preach. I didn't what to say. Um, but um, just a word of encouragement, Sister Barbara. Um, you've been um, uh, in your prayers, you've been praying and uh, uh, been asking, uh, praying God your favor and your blessing and your, your favor upon my life. And I uh, just want to say that those prayers haven't gone unheard. God's heard those prayers that you've been asking for favor and blessing. And uh, just let you know that God will say that blessing, that favor you've been asking. Amen. Praise God. Genesis 32. Um, Martin Lloyd Jones was a uh, um, preacher and he went to preach, get before the crowd to preach or the ministers in those days when you had to preach. And as he was coming to preach, they ministered the sermon. And as he ministered the sermon, the committee members, as they looked at him, technically they said he was a great preacher. Technically, he was good, he was sound, he got scripture, he used the scripture well. They went out and had liberation think and they came back and they kind of looked at him and they said, good preaching, but he's not limping for God. And they dismissed him as a preacher. In Genesis, it says, 22, chapter 32, verses 22, it says, Night came and he got up with his two wives and two female servants and 11 sons and crossed Jabrook. After that, he crossed the stream and he sent them over. He sent them over with his possessions. So Je Jacob was left alone. A man wrestled until daybreak. The man saw he could not overpower him. He touched the socket of his hip and he wrenched the socket as he wrestled with him. Then the man said, let me go for it's daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go until you bless me. The man asked him his name. So what's your name? And Jacob answered him. And then the man said, you will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with human to overcome. God, I pray God that your grace Upon this sermon, God, help the lives of your people, God, this day, God. Pour out your spirit, your blessing upon them, God. Father, he who has an ear, let me hear what the spirit says to him this night. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You start to think of, I'm not going to preach very well. I say that and then I go on for about an hour. <laughs> but I'm not going to preach very well. <laughs> But um, Martin Lloyd was asked, what does a man look like when he's truly met God? And he says these words, he says, he walks with a limp. When you start to think about this, Jacob was wounded by God, dislocated his hip. He was a broken. His name, Jacob was translated to Israel, which actually, when you think about the nation of Israel, it means they who wrestle with God. That's what Israel actually means. Imagine that it's called the nation, you know, uh, uh, it's called wrestle with God. <laughs> you know, and you wonder why people always fight Israel down because they always wrestle, you know. Um, and so there's a, a great lesson that Blessing comes through pain and suffering. And it was, it's not as if we 
shouldn't understand, we don't, many times you don't understand that suffering is a part of that. And if not so, you know, the Bible speaks how many times have you read the pages where Jesus had suffered, Jesus was in tears, Jesus' heart went out, Jesus had compassion, great drops of blood. I mean, you, you know, you, 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 you cannot not read the scripture where Jesus didn't have compassion about on the man with a withered hand and there's a suffering there. There's a, so, so we understand that. And so there's a transformation when that takes place. The grit, the sweat, all what the creator's done. Jacob's encountered God. And it's almost like Jacob encounters God on, a, on. There's one thing to pray and we encounter, you know, we're praying, we're believing God spiritually. Uh, trying to touch heaven and that you know we we preach that you know what touch heaven we want to we want to touch heaven want to touch god and that rightly so but you know i think maybe that's probably more rhetoric than in anything else because we we always say touch in heaven and you know if you i you know many church i go to how many want to touch heaven touch heaven but you know when you start to read the scripture and you kind of examine the way god moves uh, um, th 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 there is no really touch in heaven. Because if God really meets with you, it's going to be a grind on earth. It's going to be through grit. It's going to be through sweat. It's going to be through tears. And most of it, it's going to be physical. There's going to be a, a physical entanglement with God. And the encounter many times... Uh, for those who say they want to meet with God, the experience will always be painful. That's where everybody goes, I'm out. <laughs> See you later, I don't need part of this church no more. <laughs> There's not something we like to hear. Because we're always preaching encouraging messages. And, um, but the truth is Jesus died. That's not really encouraging. <laughs> but it's encouraging for those for salvation. But the truth is, if you're going to meet with him, it's going to be gritty. If you're going to meet with him, you're going to, you're going to toil a bit. There's going to be some pain. There's going to be, there's going to be frustrations. There's going to be all these things mixed up. Because if, if we're going to receive anything from him, it's not going to fall like manna from heaven. Yeah, that was, that was in the Old Testament. Manna fell from heaven. That was to get them to a point. But now they're at that point. We have the Savior. Jesus has died. Jesus has done the sacrifice. Now we know that. But the rest of everything else we're going to have from Christ is going to come with some struggles. And, you know, when we start to think of struggles, we, we kind of think to ourselves, uh, you know what, um, uh, um, you know, we need to have, um, you know, some form of uh, um, education is going to come with education, good standing, good, good, moral. not all the time it comes like that. Now, God doesn't always try to get us to this place to be an educated person, to be a smart person. We all think that's what God is looking for. You know, there, there, there are some that are like that and they have a benefit in the kingdom. But it's not always going to be like that. It's going to be, you know, God looks upon people that will, will wrestle and struggle and try to, to find him and, uh, and pursue with him and try to, to find who God is. That should help you. Because many times it's what God wants to do in your life. Not just for you to to find this right place, but where you are struggling and where you wrestle with him and where you toil with him, maybe nobody understands, but that's what sometimes what God wants to do. Wrestle with him. You see, for you and I, Western culture as a church, we always seem to celebrate the wealth and the power, the strength, the confidence, the prestige, the victory. And that's what, that's what we do. And then, and then all of a sudden, we despise failure, disappointments. Uh, we despise those uh, uh, whose uh, discouragement, depressed. Uh, and you know what? But that's, that's really part of really, that's really normal life. You know, we always kind of think Christianity is, you know, every day is a victory. We always got a song to sing. Most days, there's no song. 
<laughs> you know, we say, I'm trading my sorrow. Most times it's like, like well, I ain't got nothing, but my sorrow, that's all I have. It's like, trade for what? It's like, it's like, the song sounds good when we're all singing it. It's like, trade, trade you took my sorrow. It's like, it's like, take my shoes and walk in it. You know? Because we, we this, this, but this is part of Western culture. And so it seeps into the church that, you know, this is what it is. You know, um, in, in, a, in, a, in a New Testament, he who got saved knew it was imminent death. He gets saved, he's like, I'm born again. <laughs> well, you ain't going to last long. I mean, imagine that. Paul said to the church or to those about getting married, he says, you know what? It's better that you don't marry because the, the, the joy of marriage will be taken away very soon. Well, that's, a, that's a hard thing. You want to marry someone, he says, don't get married. You get married and before you know it, they're going to capture you, find out you're a Christian, and you're going to be tortured. And that's why he warned the church and says, listen, if you get married, you know what? What's going to happen? You're going to get married and then, and then you're, going to get, you're going to get caught up with the things of marriage and you're going to forget the gospel. Right? That, that's why Paul said that. And so, but it, it, was, it was kind of like Paul was laying down some truths to the church to say, you know what? It's not all happy days. And so we forget. So here's this, you know, Jacob is confronting or he has to confront his failures and his weakness and his sin because he's going to wrestle with God and this is going to be exhausting. And, you know, sometimes we're going to wrestle with God. We're going to pray and uh, we're going to seek God. We're going to pray and we're going to do all this. And so sometimes that's very exhausting. You know, you know, it's like, you know, I'm fasting. How long for? It's like two hours. But really, you know, it's like, how long? It's like, you know, nobody likes a long fast. I, I, I you know, every time they said every year is a fellowship fast, I'm like, I didn't hear. I didn't get the email. I didn't get the email. <laughs> fasting, did you get? Uh, is our church fasting this year? No, I didn't get the email. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, do you like fasting? Absolutely not. I, you, know, I, you know, I commend those people that say, you know, they come to church past every, every month. I do one day fast. Like, really? Praise God. It's like, don't ask me to fast. Because I hate it. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, you know, I'm not that spiritual in that type of way. It's like, it's like, it's like you're super spiritual. You're good. You know what I mean? In fact, take the mic. <laughs> I can't deal with that. that. Four days, five day fasting. Oh, yeah, no. You're Jesus. <laughs> but the truth is, that's where the wrestle is. That's where we're going to struggle. We're going to have to meet our failures, our hurts. And most of the times, the struggle is exhausting. And it can leave you crippled spiritually. You're crippled, you're hurt, you're, you're in agony because the struggle many times uh, to see God help you. You're wrestling for blessing. You're wrestling for, for God to move. You're wrestling for God to open doors. You're wrestling. And, and, and it's not like the wrestle is just like one day. The wrestle many times mental is many days, is many months. Uh, you're watching things taking place in your house. Uh, and sometimes even in the wrestle, the wrestle seems to get harder and harder. And sometimes in a wrestle, you're not winning. You see, we always believe and it's always preached that things are meant to get easy. You see, sometimes to have it easy is that we can make it easy by eliminating some struggles. Some things we, do, we, we say, you know, God's not going to answer the prayer for that, so let's not wrestle with that anymore. And let's not wrestle with that anymore. And let's not wrestle with that anymore. And then what you'll find is that you've got this easy Christian life because there's no more wrestling. Because we know to wrestle means toil, means hurt, means pain. And so, you know, you do that for many years and you're thinking, you know what, you know, I, I just don't want to wrestle no more. So, you know what, I settle with what I have. 
And so in Christianity, most of us settle in what we have. We're happy in what we have. We're like, you know what? The stru- no, I don't, I don't want to do that no more. And then we start to look at our lives and you know what? I've been doing it for 10 years, 15 years. It's too much. But who told you it's meant to stop? But did you think the blessing of God just stops after 10 years? I mean, who told you struggling is meant to end? I mean, I mean, it ended quick for Jesus, didn't it? It was 33 years. I mean, some of you haven't even done half of that. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was great for Paul. I mean, Paul struggled right to the end. And so we think that somehow wrestling with God is just meant to be for one day. You know, we'll all go through our trials and tribulations. We'll all go through our strives, each and every one of us. And you know what? The struggle is always messy and the struggle is always chaotic. But you see, Any form of growth is going to come with struggle. So we all want growth, but no struggle. We all want to be put on the stretching machine, but no pain. So I stretch me, God. Don't hurt me. (laughs) Everything is meant to, it's almost like we ask for blessing, and then we think blessing must come overnight with nothing, no pain, no toil. But that's not true. It's going to come with, you know what? Sometimes the blessing is going to come with, I mean, the cuts are going to be deep. So here's Jacob. So Jacob's walking with a limp. And so, um, so it's like, here he is, he's, he's walking with his limp, but everybody knows why he's limping. There's nobody fool. There's nobody says, oh, he walks with a limp. What happened to him? They all know. They all know this is all because he met with God. And they all know the river, Jabru. They all know the area. And so it was, it was named, the same name he wrestled with God there. So it's like, it's like, you know, we turn around, we say, you know, you go up to Tottenham and you say, just by the football stadium, turn left. Imagine now saying, just pass, just go past wrestle with God. Imagine that. What does that mean? Wrestle with God. You don't know where wrestle with God? Wrestle with God's on the left-hand side. <laughs> it's like, why is it called wrestle with God? You don't know the man that walked up the road in the limp. I rest in wrestle. Jamaican. It always, it always sounds good in Jamaican, doesn't it? <laughs> it never sounds good in Chinese. That's how I got. I thought, oh, yeah. You know, or Indian. The rest of it God. You know, Jamaican sounds really heavy. Like, you know, no, the man that wrestles with God. <laughs> so, got, this, got this kick to it, innit? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but a man wrestled with God up the road. And everybody knew the road. And everybody looked at this man. But you see, most people want to be like that. But with no limp. The Bible tells us he wrestled that night. And the truth is, Many times our wrestle is going to be in a dark place. And it's going to feel dark. And you know, only in the dark does it really feel lonely. Only in the dark, when you're wrestling with God and you're you're trying to find the blessings of God for your life, it's always a dark and lonely place. It's never a place where everybody's there. And you know what? There's nobody rejoicing with you. Nobody spurring you on in the fight. Go on, fight, fight. You don't get no crowd. There's no applause. There's nobody. It's just pitch black. And the wrestle many times, sometimes you may see yourself in your walk and you're, 
you may be confused. And, you know, we always think, you know, all right, I know God's not the author of confusion. Well, God is not the author of confusion because there's nothing confusing about God. But, you know, sometimes our wrestle can be confusing. No, God's not all for that. So it's basically telling you God doesn't add confusion to your life. Very disciplined God. But it doesn't mean that in your, your personal struggles with God and your wrestling with God, you know, sometimes in the dark, you don't know where you're punching. You don't know what you're grappling with. You don't know the outcome. You don't know what you're really fighting. Or in other words, you don't know what you're really up against. You don't know who they are. Because the Bible says he wrestled with the man. The only reason we know it's God because it's revealed. We can read the scripture plainly. But Jacob didn't know it was God. He didn't know what he was up against. All he says, there was a man. And he wrestled with And that's a really, that's a really complicated scripture because you're talking about it's revealed afterwards. You know, we have many scholars and we have many thoughts about this. Many scholars have thoughts that was it there, was this, was it a dream? You know, because yes, we know Jacob dreamed and he had he had those thoughts, but it seems very real because of where we're reading it and what position of the Bible reading it is Genesis, and it's kind of like the God miracle book where God reveals a lot about himself. So I guess here he is and he's wrestling with a man. And we, we now we're seeing it. This is God this man is wrestling with. God meets with him. And he doesn't know. And, you know, many times we don't know what we're wrestling with. We don't know because wrestling is always done. It seems like it's always in a dark place. Seems like it's always in a confusing place. And many times it's a probably a good place where it's dark and it's confusing many times for you and I because we cannot see what we're dealing with. Many times, I suppose, this is where we quit. This is where we give up. This is where the battle is lost. The battle is always seems to be lost because we always want to know we're up against and that we always want to quit the fight because we say, you know what? I can't overpower you because I can see who you are. And when you know what you can see, you already know that we, you already know the challenge. And because you can see the challenge, you know what it is. And so you have the opportunity to let the challenge or, or it win or you fight on. But most of us always pick the easy battles. We pick things that we know we can do. We choose to fight the battles we know we can win. We choose to fight the things we know we have maybe, you know, the, the upper hand slightly. So it's not really a fight. But many times the real battles is the ones you cannot see. You don't know what you're up against. The ones that you say, you know what, I need God to move, but, but I don't know how he's going to move for me. Is always battled in a lonely place. Because fighting and wrestling is always a lonely place. It's always a hard place. It's always lonely. And battling, not just, not just pain. Because, you know, you dislocate your hip. Uh, the fibula, I believe it's called. You dislocate your hip. That's some serious eye-watering pain. That's not, you know, it say Jake would cry, but you know what? If he didn't cry, I mean, I'd be surprised. You know, three hours, in, 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 I think it's three hours, three hours, if that's not put back, you're in permanent damage. And we know he was in permanent damage because the Bible says he walked with a limb. And so that meant every time he walked, he'd have been in excruciating pain. For all of his life. Because he wants to be blessed. But it's remarkable that he chose to still fight on. Because I'll tell you what. You touch the socket of my hip. I'd be like, oh, yo, okay. <laughs> just, just, just a touch would make me quit. But you see. For every believer in Christ. We always kind of want to hear that 
there's an easy road. And the sermons are designed or people preach because it's like happy juice every Sunday. It always remind me, I start thinking about services and sermons. It's like, it's like the baby with the bottle of juice. You're welcome. It's like every Sunday. You're welcome. Go <laughs> <laughs> <Your> home now. That's <laughs> all this evening. Because <laughs> like, we think every sermon is like that. And so we, we live looking for sermons like that. We're looking for that. But if you really knew that, really, you know, real Christianity is a real fight. You can get up in the morning ready for a fight. Ready to battle. Ready to, you know what, you know, I want something out of that. I'm closing. Blessing does really come. It really does come. The struggle is real, but blessing does come. Because the Bible said it really clearly. It says, by daybreak. See, there's always a hope that there's always a light in the darkness. I think it was the King uh, Henry and the poem went something like, he comes to the man at the gate and he says to the man at the gate, give me light so I can pass through the darkness. And the man at the gate says, stretch your hands out in the darkness and grab hold of the light you know. For the light you know is better than the light that you can hold. And he will lead you through the darkness. And he's saying that about Jesus. He says, you know what? Light will come. Blessing will come. Because the daylight is coming. And as the day, the Bible says, as twilight. Another scripture calls it twilight. It says, as twilight. That first sign of light. God says to him, okay, I'm going to bless you because you have wrestled with me. And it's almost like God teaches us a great lesson here. When we toil with God, when we wrestle for things of God, not just for ourselves, for our family, our future, we believe in God, we're wrestling with God. And, you know, I sometimes sit there and say, you know, God, why don't you just... Why don't you just bless us anyway? But you know, the truth is, if God was just blessing, bless, I mean, salvation is the greatest blessing you could ever have. That's a miracle. But all the other stuff, you, you know, God, why don't you just bless us? See, many times you watch people through life just, just, just want blessing, and they never seem to appreciate anything God does. So he's like, don't you appreciate that? You know, you've never worked a lick in your life. I mean, you, mean, you haven't even struck a matches. I mean, that's too hard for some people. And all of a sudden, you know, you're like, like you're blessed. You know, as a, as a, I remember this young girl. She came to me and she says, "You know, Pastor, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to give up my house." I'm like, oh, it's like, well, you know, uh, and so we went to her house. It's like. Why does your house look so bad? No, I'm sorry, I was just being honest. <laughs> I was like, I was like, do you know what a mop is? Do you know what a rag is? Do you know what soap liquid is? Fairy? Do you know what bleach is? Do you know what, do you know any cleaning material? And she says, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it up. I'm like, they blessed you with that. I mean, you didn't even work for it. I mean, they've blessed you. They've given you a blessing. They, they've blessed you. Like, well, I'm, I don't want to decorate it. Like, Why do you want to decorate it? Because it's not mine. But so you're just going to live in this? Because it's not yours? Don't, don't you want to get up in the morning and look at a nice color on the wall? Yeah, but it's not mine. And the landlord will be blessed if I paint it. He's been there for six years. I mean, what, who cares? 
No, you just want to fix up the yard because you because you lived there. Then you start to realize, doesn't matter what you bless people with, they still don't appreciate it. And then you have to say, that's why probably God himself won't give people blessings. Because if you throw blessings, you'll just be living like with no bleach, no soap, no nothing. You just won't recognize what God's doing. You won't, you, you won't appreciate any blessing that God's done. You won't, it won't bring you to your knees in a place of humbleness. Well, you know what, God? I don't deserve that. Man, why, I don't, who am I that you would give me that? Who am I that you would even think of blessing me? And so a lot of the stuff we do that comes through sweat, toil, and wrestling. But I want to encourage you that daybreak is coming for those of you who've been struggling. And those of you who've just been looking for an easy way or, you know what, uh, I know a man touched me here, did this. You know, sometimes it just comes by going on your knees. Lloyd, I was asking one of the pastors, says, why would they call him the Prince of Preachers when they say Charles Spurgeon is the Prince of Preachers? They said, well, Charles Spurgeon was back in those days, but as a new preacher, he, Lloyd said, you know what, I listened to all these other preachers, and what all these other preachers were doing, they were they were preaching with energy, and, and they were like, come on, hallelujah, and they were really got that, that they were working the crowd. And so Lloyd said, you know, I didn't want to work the crowd. I didn't want to use any skill that I had. So I went very monotone. And I just preached. And so when you listen to him, he would be like an old English professor. Just, and I want to tell you that he goes through you. And he's very monotone. And he said, the reason I was like that, because I met with God. And I wanted somehow God to move through this and touch lives. And he did exactly that in his life. So every time somebody listened to him, they said, I have met with God. There's something different about his preaching. And everybody knew when you look, look at his literature he wrote, you start to think, oh, you know what, that's a bit... The revelations are very, 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 his revelations are very scary. But then you realize, even to get that type of revelation, you must have met with God. I listen to some preachers and, and, I, and, I, you know, and they don't have teams of editors and writers. This is them. I know one pastor, tragedy has come upon him. But when you listen to him, you get that revelation. Pastor Warner was here not very long ago. Pastor Warner's in a wheelchair. And then you listen to him preach for one hour and 20 minutes. But then you think to yourself, it was only about, it's only been about 30 minutes. And he says, every head bow and every eye closed, you think it. <laughs> but good sermons seem so short. So people say, you know what? I want to preach like Pastor Warner. We say, get a wheelchair. You want to have a ministry like that? You're going to have to take the pain with it too. You can't just have what they have with no pain. And this is what people want. They want what other people have, but no pain. They want everybody's blessing, but no pain. They want every, everybody's touch, but no wrestle. Nobody wants to walk with a limp. But if you want to meet with God on any serious level, you're going to have to be limping. And people will see and notice your limp. They will notice the difference in the way you walk. So my question tonight would be simply this, just before we bow our heads. How's your limp? How's your limp? Does anybody see it? Because you want a deeper revelation of God to meet with him in a, in a completely different way. 
you will never walk the same. You will never walk the same. You can walk out of here and say, well, <laughs> I don't want that. Well, that's fine. That's fine. But anything you want from me, it will cost you a little. Let's have every head bowed, we'll have clothes on then. You know, I used to, there was a, a time where I used to listen and I used to say, where Paul says, I want to know you and the power of your resurrection. And I used to, I used to listen to that. I, I hear that. I want to know you and the power of your resurrection. And I guess it was a great scripture for me to listen to. But now, just through the circumstances of life or just life itself or just being a preacher watching people's lives now I say God I actually do want to know you and the power of your resurrection because I actually do want to know you and I really do want to know the power of your resurrection and I realize that the walk of Christ, the battle's never going to stop. There is going to be no easy road. But I realize in all of what I'm doing and what you are doing, it's going to affect other people. You know, sometimes you think to yourself, as you're walking in your walk, you think, well, it's for you. But the truth is, it's not really for you, it's for others. You know, supposing I don't. I read a piece of literature, literature and it was saying, talks about generations and then I read Deuteronomy and it says like the ancestors taught us teach others to know God and where we failed as a nation and failed as a people would be probably this we teach them nothing so they have nothing so yeah I do walk with a limp yeah, I do have a limp, but it's not for me. My limp is for Ryan and Natalie and Selena. My limp is for my church. Yeah, I walk with a limp. Yeah, I do struggle. I face the struggle every day. I face the grinding mindsets, the howling of the wolves. Yeah, I do. But you know, I know it's not for me. It's for others. So others may know Christ and the power of his resurrection. It's so easy for me to quit the race. But you see, there's others behind me, you see. So I can't. So I need to teach people so people can see how to be blessed. People do need to know how to find him. Yeah, and it's going to come through a great sacrifice, which we all have to do, church. There are men in this place where God has called you. And it's easy to back out of the race. It's easy to count yourself out and to say, woe is me. Do you ever want to do anything great for God? You're going to have to face those. And when you speak, they're going to have to say, summarize. Has he limp is he limping yet? Is he limping yet? Because people know for the limp. So I want to bring, maybe you're here this evening. I don't know the condition of your heart. and I don't know where you're at. But you say, preacher, I'm not right with God. 
I'm not saying you don't believe in him. Of course you do. But I'm not right with him and I'm asking you. Maybe that's you this evening. You say, would you pray for me? Would you remember me in prayer? We'll pray for you. How many is there? You're not right with God. You say, pray for me. I want to know Jesus in a new way. Quickly stick your hands up and strip that down again. We'll pray for you. Not sit front to back left and right. Amen. Let me change your order of the service. I know it's a strange sermon to ask, but maybe you're here tonight and you say, you know what? I have been looking for the easy road. And I've, I only wrestled what I can see. But God, you know, I'm willing to wrestle with the issues of my life. The things that I've just put aside and say, well, dang it, you know, it's okay. But you know what, God? I actually, I actually want you to open the door in this area. I, I do want to be blessed in this area. I do want favor in this area. It's not a one-day wrestle, though. It won't be a one-day wrestle. And God will get down on earth with you and in the grit on this planet. He will get down in the gritty soil and wrestle with you. But the daylight is coming. So I guess what I'm asking you this evening is, would you wrestle with, would you bring, would you come before God and say, God, you know what? I want to believe you for this blessing in my life I'm actually going to bring this back to your table again it'll be a long wrestle but daylight is coming if we continue to wrestle so I want to open this altar for you this evening the promises of God are yes and amen and you know It's going to be hard. Nothing's easy. Most of us can go out in the street and pick the things we want. But, it, but when it's from God, it's completely different because it, it fits and it's right. So I want to open this altar for you. There are people who know what I'm speaking about and you exactly know 